Good morning, friends. Uh, today is World Stroke Day. Um, this day is observed to spread the awareness about the lifestyle disease of stroke because many of the people who had stroke will not be coming to the hospital early. And even then, if they come to the hospital, sometimes stroke may be missed or sometimes stroke may not be managed with adequate sense of urgency uh, by the system so that they will have permanent disability due to inadequate care. So I am Dr. Vivek Nambiar, Head of Division of Stroke, Amrita Institute and Dr. Akash here, a Fellow in Stroke Medicine, a Neurologist. Uh, today uh, we will learn stroke by seeing few cases and some other uh, management issues we will discuss so that it will be important not only for learning but also for practice. Okay, we'll go with the first case. Yeah, the first slide. So, we know the there are hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke, and we know the risk factors. It's a major healthcare burden in the society, and we know the time is brain is a principle. So, we have discussed the previous session also. Time is brain. That is the most important principle. Everything which we do about stroke, like whether taking to hospital, doing the scan doing the treatment, everything is based on a principle called time is brain. It is not a simple phrase. It is the real core principle of stroke management because you want to take him early because you want to save time so that he will be reperfused early and he will be getting a life back. So even if you do, if you want to start anti-edema measures, you start at the earliest because you want to prevent edema and destruction of the brain. You, if you are deciding to operate the patient, operate early. So every time, time is important. So that is time is brain principle. Next slide. So we know the different stroke subtypes and incidents. We have hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke. In Asian ethnicity, we know that we Asians are more prone for hypertension, lifestyle diseases. Uh, we are a little bit more prone than the Caucasian population. Uh, because of several genetic polymorphisms. So, hemorrhagic strokes are slightly high in the community compared to ischemic stroke. So, it is sometimes 85% percentage versus 15%, percentage, sometimes 13% percentage hemorrhagic stroke. You know, it is slightly less in the Western community, maybe like 10 to 11%. Percentage. So, uh, this is very important because we know we want to do the CT scan to identify whether it is ischemic or hemorrhagic. So, different managements will be there for this type of stroke. And hemorrhage, Again, time is brain because if you control the hemorrhage early, there will be less brain damage. Okay. Yeah, we, we know the basic risk factors, obesity, smoking, high LDL cholesterol, cardiac disease, diabetes. And among this, most important thing is the heart disease and high blood pressure. These are the core risk factors of stroke. So, high blood pressure can cause two types of strokes, both ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. The ischemic stroke is due to small vessel disease causing lipohyalinosis, a change in the smaller arteries called lipohyalinosis which will cause small infarctions which will, which will be resulting in uh, reduced memory or sometimes lacunar stroke syndrome, you know right ataxic hemiparesis, left ataxic hemiparesis, small small strokes which will recover fast but when they come a lot of lacunar stroke that will result in less memory and Parkinson's like illness. So that is very important. So high blood pressure and heart disease, especially we know, atrial fibrillation, cardiac failure, left ventricular float, all these are major causes of stroke. So we have to identify these causes of stroke and then we have to do effective preventive measures to prevent further recurrence of stroke. Okay, let us start with some cases. Uh, Dr. Akash, can you go through the slides? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will be discussing the first case now. So basically, this is a 63-year male who has presented to our uh, casualty department. He is a diabetic and he presented with a sudden onset of speech difficulty within the last three hours. When he initially came to the ER, at that time, his blood pressure was 160 by 100. There was no cranial nerve involvement. Power in all the four limbs was almost 5 by 5 grade. But however, on speech examination, he had problems in comprehension as well as expression. So he had a global aphasia. 
so now we need to act fast so this is the motto which has been described uh, widely and uh, here b fast stands for loss of balance suddenly uh, loss of vision in one uh, visual eye field uh, if there is a asymmetry in the facial expression whether there is any weakness in the arm or leg whether there is any problem in the speech and then t stands for time because time is brain as i said this is very important because sometimes we recognize stroke with weakness of the hand or facial deviation or just hemiplegia so but uh, these things are important sometimes the field defect we will not examine some patients coming with a disorientation to the emergency can have a field defect and that is why they are getting disoriented so especially in posterior cerebral artery infarctions or posterior cerebral artery uh, bleeds that tertiary blue occipital artery occipital tertiary bleeds so the issue is some elderly man is coming with acute confusion uh, we get we think it is delirium we think it is something else but it may be a stroke so always examine the field in a patient who is disoriented that is the just take home message from this case this uh, this is aphasia sometimes people come with only aphasia then also we get confused wernicke's aphasia patient will be talking many things which are unrelated so we may get confused as if the patient has got some psychiatric symptoms or something but the 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 point is something happened suddenly it is a cerebrovascular accident unless otherwise proved so let us go through the case yes so the next thing that has to be done as a physician is to stratify or to grade the level of deficit that the patient has so what we do is we calculate the score which is called nihss national institute of health stroke scale so here in this particular case the nihss has been calculated to be 7 so what is nihss just let's go through what are the factors which are seen in the nihss so you see the level of consciousness the uh, loss of loss of consciousness questions and the loss of consciousness commands there are two points for each uh, the best gaze uh, the best visual field whether there is any visual loss in a particular field uh, then the facial weakness then the motor uh, weakness in the uh, arm and the legs right as well as left uh, the limb ataxia the sensory loss uh, whether any problem in uh, extinction and uh, whether any issues in uh, uh, articulation and the language so all these factors have to be calculated and there will be specific points for each and every uh, uh, situation and according to that we will uh, categorize whether it is a good nihss whether it is a moderate nihss or whether it is a bad nihss here we get a nihss of, of 7 the patient has presented very early so the first thing that we have done here is a urgent mri stroke protocol yes. and here you are seeing the images the images that we have shown here are the dwi the adc and the flare images from right to left so here in the dwi we can see that there is a, a diffusion restriction area of diffusion restriction just adjacent to the insula doctor agar just a minute i just tell them what the diffusion weighted images is the best imaging to identify acute stroke so what is the principle of this imaging so if you do a ct scan the infarct will not be seen in the ct scan unless it is about 6 hour 8 hour or 24 hour but in this mri imaging you can see that the diffusion is actually when there is a membrane dysfunction at the cells due to ischemia the water molecular movement will be restricted so that is called diffusion restriction so this restriction will be seen as increased hydrogen ion concentration in the cells so which would be picked up by the uh, mri so this imaging is the best and early one to identify stroke so in this scan we can see there is a, a change in the diffusion restriction in the insular cortex on the left side and that is a, an area of infarction which is ongoing infarction happening there maybe some amount of tissue damage but uh, however you can see the other images the third row you can see the flare images and flare images are not showing uh, showing much changes so which means the that damage is not complete it is less than 4 hours or 4.5 hours that is how you differentiate in the mri the timing of the infarction so if the uh, diffusion images is positive 
and flare images the last row of images is uh, negative it is actually a, 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 a stroke which is less than 4.5 hours okay what we have done dr agash so, so along with the initial mri stroke protocol we also get a time of flight imaging which will basically uh, without the contrast material required it will basically show us uh, how the blood flows through the brain. So here we see that uh, there is a distal uh, M1 occlusion. There is a sudden cutoff after uh, the MCA uh, ends. So uh, we are uh, probably estimating there will be an occlusion at this site. So what, what should be done next? There are many options which can be considered. So we can thrombolize the patient. The other option is we can thrombolize and then if there is no clinical improvement or we don't see a recanalization, we can go for a mechanical thrombectomy. We can also go for a di direct mechanical thrombectomy or like in certain cases where uh, there is a very uh, limited financial, we can also go for uh, medical management if uh, the patient is not willing for taking the risk. So actually this patient is a typical patient for with a distal MC of mid-cervical artery occlusion and this is a very good candidate for thrombolysis and this is well within the window of the thrombolysis that is 4.5 hours. So usually we thrombolyze the patient within 4.5 hours of window but however there are new trials uh, which shows that we can thrombolyze the patient maybe up to 6 to 9 hours in selected cases not all cases. So this patient is a good candidate. He, he came, uh, she came within uh, three, uh, three, three and a half hours. So it's a good candidate for IV thrombolysis. So, okay. Yeah, so we took a decision to thrombolyze the patient because the patient was in a uh, window and he seemed to be a good candidate. It was not a very high NIHS score and there was a possibility of salvage. So, uh, what are the indications of thrombolysis, which is a very important thing all should know what are the indications of thrombolysis and what are the contraindications. So according to the American Heart Association guideline, uh, the basic and the most important uh, indication is there is a diagnosis of a ischemic stroke and a bleed has been ruled out and the patient is in 4.5 hours of the onset of the symptoms. Yeah, as sir said, there are new studies in which there have been exceptions and uh, we can thrombolyze even beyond uh, 4.5 hours in certain cases but 4.5 hours is the standard if there is no special situation. Additionally, uh, if we think that uh, there is a diffusion restriction mismatch even after 4.5 hours, then we can go for a thrombolysis in cases of stroke of unknown time of origin and wake up strokes. So that is the new addition to this. And uh, yeah, it is the majority of the studies have taken place in age more than 18 years. So it is approved for age more than 18 years. The contraindications everyone show, the most important contraindication is a hemorrhagic stroke. So you don't thrombolyze in a hemorrhagic stroke. Additionally, we have a long list of uh, contraindications. contraindications. But uh, one thing which you have to remember is we have to rule out two things. One thing, systemic coagulopathy. Second thing, like for example, patient is taking warfarin and high INR, do not do that. And if there is a bleed in the CT scan or there is a already fully evolved infarct in the brain, in the CT scan. In those situations, it is high risk uh, to have a bleed. So, those situations. In simple words, all ischemic stroke patients with a disabling stroke, like for example, even though NHS score is less, some, for example, one driver, he used to drive ambulance or vehicle but if he is developing a hemianopia due to occipital infarct he is having a disabling deficit because NHS will come only one or two but this driver's job will be lost and he cannot drive anymore so that is a disabling deficit so if the patient comes within 4.5 hours and there is hemianopia NH is only one or two that also we will thrombolyze because it is a disabling deficit so any disabling deficit with ischemic stroke coming within 4.5 hours without major contraindications we would try to thrombolyze that is the basic nutshell of this thrombolytic treatment. Additionally we all know that uh, there are some relative contraindications 
so bp very important thing is bp uh, more than 185 by 110 is a relative contraindication you can still go ahead with the thrombolysis with an increased risk however active efforts should be put at controlling the blood pressure as early as possible similarly patients who are on vitamin k antagonists so warfarin whose inr is less than 1.7 or even one, more than 1.7, active efforts should be made to bring down the INR to less than 1.3 for a safer thrombolysis. So all these things has to be considered if before you go for a uh, thrombolysis treatment. So what are the options available for thrombolysis? So we have two options right now. We have uh, a FDA approved alteplase that is RTPA which is a thrombolytic agent. We generally give 0 0.9 milligram per kg of alteplase which has to be given as a bolus dose as well as as an infusion. So uh, the 10 percent of the total dose calculated will go as a bolus and the remaining 90 percent will go as a continuous infusion over a period of one hour. Tenecteplase there are trials which uh, prove that its uh, efficacy and safety as much as alteplase however it has not been yet FDA approved. So uh, tenecteplase can also be used. The benefit is it is a single uh, bolus dose and you don't have to yeah, monitor. Dr. Akash, what you have done for this patient, can you show the slides of uh, the scans of the patient after thrombolysis? Yes, yeah, sir. So this is the 12 hour post thrombolysis yeah. scan. But uh, this is the uh, yeah, angiogram. This is the immediate uh, post uh, thrombolysis CT angiogram. Yeah. So in the CT angiogram, you can see that uh, occluded left MC is open fully. So that is that means that the thrombolytic treatment was very effective and patient had symptomatic improvement also. In the in the slide in the CT angiogram, this is the contrast CT angiogram, which shows that there is a good uh, amount of vessel seen on the left side uh, compared to the right side. Left side is the occlusion side. That means that is open already. So this is a very good case for thrombolysis means you can give distal MC occlusion, you can give thrombolysis, patient can get better only with thrombolysis. So we can see the CT, Dr. Akash, can you show the scan? Yeah, this is uh, a scan which is post uh, 12 hours of thrombolysis just to rule out whether it is not going into a hemorrhagic conversion or active bleed. So, so you can see there is certain infarct there in the, in the, in the, in the CT scan. But however, uh, it's not a large infarct or a massive infarct. So patient clinically improved yes. and uh, patient has been discharged. So that is the, uh, so the uh, the thing is, uh, whenever there is a chance to thrombolyze, it's a simple treatment. It is an injection treatment, no need of cat lab or too much equipment. If you judge the patient, do the NHS scoring, confirm it is a disabling stroke, you can go out with the thrombolysis. And if you do a CT angiogram or MR angiogram, there is a distal occlusion and that is a good candidate, really good candidate. Do not miss these patients from thrombolysing. So refer the patients early to stroke unit for thrombolysis if they are having uh, very disabling deficits. So as you can see the outcome improved from as sir said from uh, 7, uh, the NIHS has dropped from 7 to 3 post thrombolysis at the time of discharge. MRS also improved. MRS is a modified ranking. Yeah scale, scale yeah. that uh, basically is to grade uh, the uh, physical disability of the patient. Uh, like this is used as a monitoring tool for patients from time to time. So you can see this is a table that we are showing uh, which is uh, describing the various scores of a modified ranking scale. Zero is no symptoms at all. Uh, one is no significant disability despite uh, symptoms and is able to carry out his usual daily activities. 2 is a slight disability and uh, he is unable to carry out all his previous activities but is able to look after his own affairs without assistance. 3 is a moderate disability. Here he requires some help uh, but he is able to walk without assistance. 4 is moderately severe disability and the patient is not able to walk without assistance and is unable to attend to his own bodily needs without assistance. And 5 is a severe disability in which the patient is bedridden incontinent and requires a constant nursing attention and six is more even than dead. Yeah. So this is just a scaling to understand the clinical disability of the patient modified ranking scale. Briefly it is six is dead and five is very bad patient in the ICU or in the multiple ways and and four is actually a person who cannot perform day-to-day -day activities 
Three is somebody who can perform all day-to-day -day activities and can be left at home alone for 24 hours. Two, zero and one. Zero is absolutely normal. One, some symptoms like sparsity or some stiffness. Two is having some symptoms so that he is not able to run or if he is a football player, he is not able to play. So, this is a simple measure to identify the disability, to grade the disability. Okay. So, the new thing about thrombolysis is, as we discussed earlier also, yeah. mm -hmm. you can thrombolyze even after 4.5 hours provided that there is a significant mismatch between the diffusion weighted imaging and the flare imaging. Yeah. So, ju just let me tell you a briefly about what is this mismatch. So, you see a significant hyperintensity on the diffusion weighted images or a diffusion restriction on a diffusion weighted image. However, the flare appears fairly normal or the volume of the infarct on the flare imaging is slightly smaller, significantly smaller as compared to the diffusion weighted imaging. And uh, this has been demonstrated in the wake up trial and it shows that uh, even beyond the conventional window, you get benefit in such group of patients. Similarly, the new thing is that tenecteplase has shown equality uh, to RTPA in terms of uh, safety as well as efficacy. So, that is the NOT test trial and it is uh, uh, it has been used uh, in various places. Yeah. One of the advantages of the tenecteplase is actually it can be given as a bolus. So, the, the, the thrombolytic, usual thrombolytic agent is the TPA is an infusion. It take one and a half, one hour to one and a half hours to complete. So, basically, this is a bolus injection, so that will save time. So that is for time is brain principle. Tenative place may be a better thing for administration. Okay, we'll go to the next case, Doctor. So we will discuss about uh, case two now. This is basically a 62-year-old male. He has uh, suddenly collapsed in the bathroom. His son heard the collapse and uh, he immediately rushed to the bathroom. So he saw that the patient was mute. And he was unable to move his right side of the body. He was immediately taken to the nearby hospital. Here it was uh, evaluated and it was found that he had an irregularly irregular pulse. His initial blood pressure was 180 by 100 and on detailed neurological evaluation he was found to have a fluctuating level of uh, alt, uh, consciousness. He was also having a forced left gaze deviation. He also seemed to have a right visual field defect. And there was a global aphasia along with right hemiplegia and there was uh, loss of pain sensation over the right side of the body. Okay, Dr. Agash. So, this is a, a patient with uh, right hemiplegia and aphasia plus there is a gaze to the left. So, how this gaze to the left happened? As we know, gaze to one side is determined by the, uh, the cortex of the opposite side. Like our, uh, we are looking to the left or right by the left cortex. So, if the left cortex is paralyzed or there is ischemic stroke, what will happen? There is no balance between the two gaze centers. So, the right cortex will overact so that the eye will be deviated to the left. So, somebody with a left MCA infarction will have a gaze looking to the left because the left side cortex is paralyzed and there is no uh, push to the right. So, it will be to the left side. Okay, so that is the uh, importance. So, when you see somebody with a stroke and a gaze to left, understand that this is a large stroke involving the cortex. So, this patient ne needs urgent uh, attention and imaging and further management. So, according to all the deficits that we uh, evaluated, we found that the NIHSS was very high. It was 22. So, what do we do next? We do a urgent CT brain. And here in this particular CT scan, you can see that there is a hyperdensity where the MCA should be. So that is called the classical hyperdense MCA sign. It means that there is a probable uh, occlusion at the proximal MCA here. Yeah, this is a very interesting sign because this hyperdense sign is the thrombus sitting inside the C in the uh, and the vessels will be seen in the CT scan. So. Plain CT scan, you can see the blood vessel white. So, that is hyperdense MCA sign. So, this is a very important sign. Should not be missed when you work in the periphery because it gives a clue that patient had a major vessel occlusion. And in this patient, other point is aspect score is 10, which is an excellent scan. So, that means it is very early. Nothing has happened. Only electrical failure. Nothing has happened. The patient is, brain is preserved now. If you do something, we can really, really get back the patient completely. 
Okay. So at this point, as sir said, we can salvage the patient to its maximum possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can recover from the disability to quite a certain extent. So, uh, can you show the aspect here. score in a slide? Okay. So, basically, uh, you can see that uh, aspects is Alberta stroke program early CT score. And uh, there are various demarcated areas in this CT scan. There are two cuts at different levels. And uh, it basically shows territory of the MCA. So there is a M1 area, then there is an M2 area, there is a M3 area. Then on a higher cut, there is a M4, M5 and M6 area. Then you have subcortical structures. So the subcortical structures here uh, come to insula, the lentiform nucleus, the chordate and the internal capsule. So all of these areas will have a single score and uh, whatever area, particular area will show a hypodensity or there will be a change in uh, 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 gray white matter differentiation in a particular area that will be taken as a score of 1 and then it will be calculated as a negative from the score of 10. So if the aspects is 10 then it is excellent, it is a very good CT scan. If the aspect is 4 or 3 it is a very bad aspects and it means that the prognosis will be very poor if you do intervention. Yeah. So in short, this is a simple scoring system which will help us to understand the prognosis of the patient just from the first CT. So if the first CT is very good, good aspect, this patient if treated well will get a complete recovery. That is a very important aspect of stroke. So, so next slide, yeah, you can see the CT angiogram here. CT angiogram is showing exactly a very important fact. The left middle cerebral artery we can see in the red arrow that uh, there is an occlusion of the left middle cerebral artery and exactly the place where we are seeing the hyperdense sign. So what occlusion we are seeing is seen in the plain CT as a hyperdense sign. And other important fact is a good collateral flow. You can see the blood vessels coming up to the red arrow. See that there is a short interruption of the blood supply and there is a uh, collaterals there. So that means this patient has got excellent collaterals and they will definitely benefit by doing any type of treatment in this patient. Can you go to the next slide? So the patient was immediately taken for uh, thro the thrombectomy. That is the mechanical removal of the thrombus. Uh, the initial shoot of the DSA shows, you can see there is no, uh, there is no, uh, you cannot see any vessel apart from the terminal ICA. So that is a short thought of, uh, sort of occlusion in the terminal ICA. So, uh, so there, but, uh, you know, you can see some collateral is filling the area. So this is a total left ICA MCO uh, occlusion. So just uh, by doing mechanical thrombectomy, we can see there is a good flow through both ACA and MCA. So e even though the in the CT scan we thought it was an MCA occlusion, it was a terminal ICA. It is called T occlusion. Means you got the T that is a neck uh, vessel, and there is a T means ACA and MCA two arms of the T. So basically, it was a T occlusion, but when we have done the thrombectomy, there is immediate opening of the both MCA and uh, ACA, uh, resulting in full recanalization. So this is an excellent case for uh, thrombectomy. Patient got a very good collateral and patient came in window, excellent outcome. So post mechanical thrombectomy, you can see the image on the uh, left. Basically, there is just a small infarct in the lentiform nucleus. But if we did not do the intervention, if we probably did not go for an early uh, mechanical thrombectomy, then it could have been very bad. It could have been a large stroke like you can see yeah. on the uh, uh, right side. Yeah. So basically, uh, this uh, intervention basically has saved this person this, from yeah. a very bad NIHS and a very bad MRS to excellent uh, NIHSs. So this scan is very important. This large area of hypodensity in the scan shows a dead tissue or a damaged brain. So this is the one which I told. If you see this scan, we never thrombolize the patient because the brain tissue is so much damaged. So, so this patient is going to die if you do not do a surgery because that will cause her herniation and swelling. So by doing thrombectomy, we were able to save large quantity of brain. That is just want to show a representative diagram on the other side. 
So, the new thing about mechanical thrombectomy is recently Dawn and Diffuse trials have shown that there is an efficacy of this particular uh, process procedure. Uh, even after uh, the conventional time period for mechanical thrombectomy previously described which was 6 hours and uh, uh, with a large vessel occlusion if there is a significant mismatch between the core and the penumbra then you can even in selected cases you can even go for uh, this procedure up to 24 hours. Yeah. So, but you have to remember we have to treat it early the patients who are coming after 6 to 8 hours we will do selected patients we can do take up for thrombectomy after doing uh, proper imaging. It is usually multimodal imaging involving the perfusion scan. So, these trials have used perfusion scan to understand if there is a salvageable tissue. So, that is an important point. Not all patients can have thrombectomy after 24 hours, but those patients whom the tissue is not dead, we can recanalize and, and actually arrange for thrombectomy. Okay. So, what is the ideal scenario for thrombectomy? In this slide, you can see that, so best thing is we do a CT scan and CT angiogram together because CT scan will take hardly 30 seconds. CT angiogram will take 1 minute. So, we finish the imaging by 1 to 1 and a half minutes and those patients who are beyond 6 hours, we can do a CT uh, perfusion also. That also take another additional 2 minutes. So, basically we can finish the whole imaging within 5 minutes. And if there is a large vessel occlusion, we can consider thrombectomy after thrombolysis. If it is more than uh, 6 hours and uh, there is salvageable penumbra in the perfusion scan, we can take up for thrombectomy. So, that is the that is just nutshell of the, of the principle. Okay, can you go to the next case? So, the case 3, this is a case of a stuttering stroke. Just a minute, I will. So, stuttering stroke is a very common thing. So, you see a patient in the emergency with uh, right hemiplegia and after some time the patient went to CT scan coming back normal and after some times, so we talk to the family say that everything is okay, no worry, nothing, the patient will become, become hemiplegic. So, this is a stuttering stroke. So, if you take a small a scan, you can see a small infarct. We are, last week we have seen one stuttering stroke and just Dr. Akash. So, basically it was a 65 year old female. And there were multiple episodes of recurring uh, right hemiparesis, slurring of speech and right facial palsy. The first event happened almost uh, one month back. At that time, there was a hemiparesis which gradually improved over 4 to 5 days. Then the subsequent event happened almost 15 to 20 days after the first event. Again, there was a hemiparesis. At that time, again, the imaging was repeated. There were new strokes in the MRI predominantly subcortical strokes and the third time the imaging happened after around 10 to 15 days again uh, was when she developed the recurrence of uh, the same event right hemiparesis and slurred speech and there was a mild right facial palsy so on the third event she came to us in the ER and uh, we uh, she came to us at that time we evaluated her in detail the NIHSS was almost 6 there were new infarcts as compared to the outside MRI. There were fresh infarcts. There were fresh areas of diffusion restriction. After the admission on day 2, suddenly she developed an aphasia. She was not able to speak properly and uh, there was uh, an issue with comprehension. She was not understanding. She was having something of a random or a jargon speech. And uh, her NIHSS dropped again from 6 to 10. So, there was another stutter after the ad, uh, admission here. So, what we did was, so, so okay, this is, you can see the slide, there is an angiogram. So, there is an injection in the, uh, into the left ICA because it is an aphasia. So, in the injection, we can see that there is a, uh, there is a tight stenosis of the left ICA on the petrocovernous path that is uh, near the terminal part. So, very narrow, narrow thing. So, basically, uh, so this is an indication where uh, you, you not thrombolysis is not effective because there are strokes, but she is go, uh, she is having recurrent strokes. So, basically here we have to do an intervention. So, you can see the wire is passed into the, into that ICA 
and uh, that lesion was very tight. Somehow the wire was passed uh, through the ICA into the MCA and uh, then uh, we have done a ballooning and balloon angioplasty. So in this situation, it may not be wise to put a stent inside because if you put the stent, we have to give double antiplatelets and uh, sometimes bleed can happen into the infarct. So just a balloon angioplasty was sufficient to be thought of. So we have done the balloon angioplasty and uh, see you can see we have the infarct in the CT scan you can see the infarct are almost the same, there is no change. So uh, she was discharged with mild dysarthria and some expressive aphasia. So that is a, a reasonable outcome. So this is a situation where you will do rescue angioplasty. This is called rescue angioplasty because uh, when she came, she was stable, she was managed with the medicines and then she worsened. So we are forced to do an angioplasty, rescue angioplasty. So this patient but this is one of the way where we manage stroke with uh, uh, in case of uh, repeated strokes and worsening. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So this is the fourth case. This is a 59 year old male. He is a chronic smoker. There is a history of CA larynx and he has received radiation therapy for the same. So in CA larynx, there is a neck radiation. Now he has presented with a sudden onset of right hemiparesis and slurred speech for the last three days. On admission, his NIHSS was uh, low, so it was five. And uh, the MRI was done, which showed areas of diffusion restriction in the left uh, MCA territory. Uh, not a significant amount of the cortex was involved here. So the NIHSS remained low. However, on vessel imaging, we did a CT angiogram. So we saw that there was a significant proximal ICA stenosis and uh, yeah. actually there is a, you know if you go through a CT angiogram you can see that uh, that arrow white arrow you can see there is a plaque uh, which is causing about 60 60 percent stenosis and this plaque may have dislodged the uh, plaque component into the distal vessel resulting in a cortical infarction so it's a very important clue that we have to do something about this this plaque is dynamic and therefore, we have to do some sort of intervention uh, in this case. So, so uh, here there are two options. Uh, one is carotid end arterectomy, yeah, and the other one is uh, carotid artery uh, stenting, angioplasty and stenting. So uh, they have its own indications. Some patients benefit from carotid end arterectomy. Some patients benefit from carotid art, uh, angioplasty and stenting. So, uh, radiation therapy per se, particularly for our patient who already had undergone radiation therapy, uh, is a contraindication for carotid end arterectomy. Uh, so, we opted for, we advised for a carotid angioplasty and uh, so, yeah, this, so this you can see this diagram, this photo, like you can see there is a very tight stenosis of the carotid on the left side. So uh, the, the middle diagram you can see the, uh, the, the balloon placed in the middle and also uh, the, you know that has been expanded maybe we have done several angioplasties to expand it and then a stent was put and it was deployed and then uh, you can see the stent placement and the stent there and also you can see the wire inside because it was in, uh, taken in between the procedure. So this is carotid angioplasty with stending. So you do angioplasty to dilate the lumen and then you place the uh, the stent to protect that lumen size. So this is carotid angioplasty and stending. Other option is endotretomy. Can you show the slide? Yes, sir. So uh, here actually uh, patients who are favorable for carotid and arterectomy uh, are patients uh, who don't have cardiac comorbidities, who have an age less than 80 years, uh, have a, a poor arch, so the access for carotid angioplasty might be difficult. So whatever is the contraindication for carotid artery stenting can be an indication for uh, CEA or carotid end arterectomy. Uh, so both things are being done yeah. and uh, it has been proven equally efficacious. So there are certain updates 
there are two landmark trials, Crest and Sapphire, yeah. which have demonstrated that uh, carotid artery stenting with proper indications is almost uh, equivalent in safety and efficacy yeah, yeah. to carotid and arterectomy. For this particular patient, actually, uh, the carotid artery was is a post-radiation scenario. In post-radiation scenario, it will be difficult to do the surgery because of the additions and the healing issues. No, tissue will be mostly fibrotic, so there will be no healing. So it is always better to go for a carotid artery stenting. And uh, previously, there was a lot of uh, thing there is uh, carotid artery is always much superior to stenting. But uh, due to the experience of the operators, due to the new type of stents and the new medications, I think nowadays randomized trials are showing that they are almost equally safe and effective. So that's why crust and sapphire studies are showing. So maybe uh, in selected situation, we can go for carotid and artery and otherwise we can go for carotid artery stenting. Okay. So next case. So uh, the fifth case. Yeah, this, this case is shown just to, you know, be aware of very common thing which we we do not want to miss because it's a most important cause of acute is your mimic or stroke very important thing or it's, it's, a, it's a very common thing so it is basically a 56 year old male he is a heavy alcoholic he woke up at around 8 am after a binge alcohol night and he was walking with a wobbly gait the wife uh, noticed that this was quite abnormal to what he was uh, used to and he, she also noticed that he was progressively becoming drowsy and then he ultimately lied down on the bed. So the thing is sometimes, you know, the alcoholic people will be drowsy, they will be walking wobbly, we think it is due to alcohol. So people may not pay attention to yes. that, that is the issue. So he came to the ER and we immediately did a CT scan which showed that there was a subdural hematoma. This is a hyperdense uh, with a concavity and there is a midline shift also. Uh, and uh, we immediately asked the neurosurgery team to evaluate and post for a burr hole evacuation. Yeah. So, this, yeah, yeah, this so is this the image post. Yeah, very important thing like, so subdual hematoma is the most common mimicker of stroke or like we have to rule out because there will be, uh, that can be in patients who are bedridden, in old people, in alcoholics, minor trauma, repeated cough, so many things can produce subdural hematoma. So whenever there is a patient who changes the sensorium, we are doing a CT scan, want to rule out bleed, including the subdural bleed, so that we have to remember. So can you show different type of subdural bleed? Sometimes it will be difficult to understand. Yes, sometimes bleed. it might be difficult to identify because the bleed might be of different age. It might appear almost iso intense uh, to rest of the brain parenchyma. Sometimes there might just be a thin rim which might be difficult to identify and it might be uh, hyp hypodense. So here you can see a picture of uh, isodense SDH on the left and a picture of subdural uh, hygroma on the right. Yeah, the one minute. This, this diagram on the right side, now very, you know, apparently if you see the CT scan, you may think it is normal, but there is some asymmetry between the sides and you can see there is some swelling of the left side, but there is no obvious bleed or white color there, but there is a hematoma. This is called isodense subdural hematoma. Very important, very, very important. We may miss it and patient will go for coma and die. So that is very important to identify the subdurals. So here you can see the difference, the same, this Picture is not of any patient, but it is just to describe how the EDH would appear, that is a extradural hemorrhage and how can it be compared with the SDH. Uh, there are certain differences which you have all uh, previously also uh, known. So the extradural hematoma will be biconvex or lenticular, whereas the subdural hematoma will be diffuse and concave. Mostly uh, the subdural hematoma will have a larger area of the brain parenchyma covered through its subdural surface. Uh, the involvement will be because of tearing of the bridging veins in the subdural hematoma, whereas extradural hematoma mostly will be to because of the injury of the middle meningeal artery or its branches. And uh, uh, there will be uh, a lucid interval. Clinically, there will be lucid interval in patients who are having the extradural hematoma. 
and uh, in subdural hum hematoma the prognosis will be slightly worse as compared to the extradural hematoma so these are the differences that uh, all of you should know uh, between extradural hematoma and subdural hematoma this is a case of sh subarachnoid hemorrhage which has happened due to aneurysmal rupture so these are different type of uh, catastrophic things will happen in the group of stroke so this is a subdural event you can see the whole of the basal cisterns are full probably this is due to a rupture of a aneurysm in the internal carotid artery uh, mostly in the internal carotid artery or left uh, mca bifurcation because there's a lot of blood across so it is so these patients require a urgent uh, ct angiogram and fixation of the aneurysm So I think, uh, can you go through the take home messages? Yeah, so if you want to conclude, uh, we all should understand why stroke is so important, why it is so life threatening, because it's so common. And uh, as we have been repeating throughout the lecture, time is brain. So the more early you treat, the better outcome there will be. Uh, please remember that the thrombolytic window is up to 4.5 hours. So ask all the patients, if you find any of the features of B fast, then ask the patient to rush, rush to the hospital as early as possible and reach to a capable center. And uh, as we all know, for, for certain types of cases or specific scenarios like wake up strokes or stroke of unknown time of origin, there can be an extension or there can be an exception to involve in this thrombolytic window. The extension of the window for thrombectomy uh, has, according to the latest dawn and diffuse trial, uh, been made up to 24 hours in certain cases. And carotid angioplasty and stenting is now considered almost hand in hand equivalent. It has its own indications and contraindication, but it is considered equal in safety and efficacy. And still, uh, lifestyle modification and control of risk factors. Yeah. Obviously, it remains the best modality of secondary stroke prevention. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, we had a reasonable discussion. I think the bottom line is uh, stroke is preventable. We have to control the risk factors and treatment of stroke is time bound. The principle is time is brain and uh, we have to identify the patients and execute the correct treatment in correct time, including thrombolysis, thrombectomy. Uh, we can give a good result. And for stroke prevention in patients with TIA, carotid angioplasty, stending, intracranial angioplasty and stending, all these are options for selected patients. Always uh, get the patient to the right place in the right time. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.